touch nearly every facet of our lives. The recovery of our economy, the renewal of our healthcare system, and how to rethink education in this new normal. There's also a growing call for leadership as racial inequalities are exposed. Ultimately, in Saskatchewan, you will decide whose ideas are worth your vote when you go to the polls October 26th. Tonight, we are live across all provincial television networks, as well as online, on the radio, and on social media. So if you want to jump in on the conversation, you can tweet, Facebook, Insta, or snap the hashtag SKDebate, and we'll be in this one together. Well, this evening's debate is taking place at the historic Provincial Archives of Saskatchewan. It has been organized by a consortium of broadcasters, including CBC, CTV, and Global News. So we warmly welcome you, our viewers and listeners in English and French across the province and the country. I think it's time to meet our two debaters who are facing off tonight. Scott Moe is the leader of the Sask Party. Ryan Miley is the leader of the NDP. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Molly. I also want to welcome our panelists posing questions to the leaders tonight. First off, we have Leader Post and Star Phoenix columnist Murray Mandrick. Vanier Scholar, former journalist and First Nations University lecturer Morel de Fiddler. Global News reporter Allison Bamford and CBC's provincial affairs reporter Adam Hunter. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that this debate is coming to you from Treaty 4 territory, the original lands of the Cree, the Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and homeland of the Métis. Let's get to the rules. Each leader tonight will have two minutes for an opening statement. After that, we will go to a reporter question. Leaders will then have 45 seconds to respond uninterrupted. Then we will open the floor for three minutes of debate on that same topic. Now, I can interject leaders to keep us on track, but when you hear this sound, the open debate is over. Now, I don't want to cut any of you off, but I will do it if I have to. At the end of the night, each leader will have two minutes for a closing statement. Leaders, there is a countdown clock in this studio. Can we both see it? Yes. Okay, we promise to stay on track and on time. Let's do it. Okay, and I just want to let everyone know I have this handy fly swatter. <laughs> if anything comes our way, we're prepared. Fabulous. Okay. Earlier, we uh, held a random draw to decide who would kick us off tonight, and that lucky winner was you, Mr. Mo. You have the first two minutes. Well, thank you very much, Molly, Molly and welcome uh, Saskatchewan this evening. I want to begin by saying thank you. Thank you to everyone in Saskatchewan for everything that you have done to control the spread of, of COVID-19. Thanks to you, to you, we are doing okay. In fact, we are doing a lot better than many other places, both in terms of controlling the virus and in re recovering our economy. More people were able to continue working safely here in Saskatchewan than in any other province in Canada. And today, Saskatchewan has the lowest unemployment rate in the nation. But the pandemic is not over, and the recovery is not over. So the question this election is, who do you trust to lead Saskatchewan's economic recovery? The Saskatchewan party has a plan for a strong recovery that makes life more affordable for everyone. We'll introduce a new tax credit that will save up to $2,100 on your home renovations. We'll help families with the costs of their kids' sports and other activities. We'll help students by increasing the Saskatchewan Advantage Scholarship. And we'll help seniors by increasing the seniors' income plan. And we'll give everyone a break by cutting your power bill by 10% all within a plan to balance our budget by the year 2024, which is something you will not hear from the NDP. Tonight is a chance for us to compare our plans, a chance for us to compare our records. We all remember the NDP's record of decline. They're a risk we can't afford. The Saskatchewan party has a plan for a strong recovery and a strong Saskatchewan. It's a plan for a strong economy strong communities, and strong families. I look forward to discussing our plan here this evening, and I once again thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mel. Mr. Miley, you have two minutes. Thank you, Molly. Thanks to our panelists. Thank you, Mr. Mo. And thanks everyone who's tuning in tonight. For me, this election is all about you. It's about us, the choice before us as a province. And it's a choice between Mr. Mo's plan for cuts that will slow down the economy and hurt people or our plan to invest now, get our economy moving again and help people out in this difficult time. Because we know 
that even before the pandemic, folks were having a harder time here in Saskatchewan. People like the, the pipe fitter I was talking to the other day, who said how sick and tired he is of seeing license plates from Alberta and Texas on the way to the job site while he sits out of work. Or the patients who are waiting in pain for the surgery they need as they see wait times that grow and grow and grow. Or the thousands of patient parents who wrestled anxiously with the decision of whether or not to send their kids back to school in already overcrowded classrooms in the middle of a pandemic. These are the people. And this is the reason I'm running to be your premier. They shouldn't have to settle. And we don't have to settle. We can do so much better. We can. Instead of sending jobs away, we can create jobs right here. Instead of overcrowded classrooms, we can help kids with the teachers and EAs they need to thrive in school. Instead of cuts and wait times, we can make sure as we invest that every patient gets the care they need when and where they need it. This is the choice, and it's such a crucial moment for our province. The choices we make today matter more than ever. This is our chance to finally put people first. Thank you, leaders. Well, let's put you on the hot seat with our first question. CBC's Provincial Affairs reporter, Adam Hunter, over to you. Thanks, Molly. We have 165 new cases of COVID-19 over the past five days. 254 active cases right now in the province. My question is, what should or will government do to prevent the spread of COVID-19? And would this include an indoor mandatory mask rule? Mr. Mo, you have 45 seconds. Well, first, I'd like to start by thanking Saskatchewan people for the efforts that they have made as individuals that has led us to the collective success and the low case numbers that we have uh, here in the province. Our total case numbers in Saskatchewan are 62% below the national average. Our total active cases today even are 60% below the national average. And thankfully, our fatalities are 92% below uh, the national average. We have safely reopened our our economy, our communities. We have safely reopened our schools uh, here in the province. As we move forward, and we saw Dr. Shahab out uh, the other day where he has reduced uh, private gathering sizes to 15. Um, but what, where we have had challenges is when people are not following the public health advice that is in place. Thankfully, the vast majority of Saskatchewan people are, and that's Thank showing you, up Mo. in their numbers. Thank you, Mr. Mo. Mr. Mali, 45 seconds. Thank you very much. You know, I'm, I'm getting pretty tired of COVID-19 and I bet I'm not the only one. This isn't the year that we had in mind. And yet people have stepped up so incredibly well across Saskatchewan. And they deserve a government that will step up for them as well. That means with clear guidance on when to use masks, how to protect ourselves. It also means not going down the road that Mr. Mo has in mind with his austerity plan of cuts. That's the worst idea right now. Now is the time for us to invest. Get people back on the job, invest in health and education, Make the investments now that keep us safe and allow us to get our economy moving and help people out in this difficult time. Thank you, Mr. Miley. Okay, it's time for our first open debate of the night on the same talk topic. What measures should be taken by the government to prevent COVID-19? And would you put in a mandatory mask ban? With respect to the masking policy in the province, we've been clear since day one. Um, when you are able to create that physical distance, like we are here this evening, uh, a mask is not necessary. When you are not able to, to have that physical distance, you should have a mask with you. I carry one with me all of the time. And you should, you should then wear that mask. We've been very clear on the masking policy that we have had in this province. Uh, it has been effective and uh, it will it will continue for the foreseeable future. Well, Mr. Mo, there has been a, a fair amount of mixed messages. At times you've been uh, offside, even with the uh, chief medical health officer. One of the things that I was really disappointed was the failure to speak out about the folks who are protesting in the anti-mask movement and really make it clear that that's not helpful. But the bigger concern for me, and, and you referenced it today, which I, I think is really important, uh, we saw the, the recommendation that we decrease gatherings from 30 to 15 people. Well... It was a private uh, gatherings. Yeah, let's talk about schools. Let's talk about classrooms. Yeah. We have classrooms of 30, 35, 40 kids. You have that's not never what the been, you've, was, Molly, yes, but you've never been willing to uh, Molly, address the uh, overcrowded class sizes. <laughs> Do you admit that we have a problem with the number of kids in our classes? As we're going to come to the class sizes, we have that in an education segment. I want to know about the masks. Uh, Mr. Marley, would you put in a mandatory mask policy? 
Now, one of the things that's been missing is clear guidance. Where should people use them and what are the thresholds? And this is what has been frustrating for, for folks in public health as well as in the well, general public. The threshold public. is two meters. No, the threshold of what, what number of cases, what rate of transmission, when would you introduce mandatory masks? But, you know, when we're talking about what's the biggest risk right now, we're talking about gatherings and, we, and class sizes are very so, uh, germane to this So, Mr. Mo, what is that threshold? The, the threshold to when, when you should wear a mask is when you're no, not... But when, in terms of in implementing a, ma a mandatory mask policy, it's something that the, the city mayor has asked very clear for. We have They've a very clear masking policy in this province that is there today. Um, if you're able to create that physical distance, a mask is not required. Um, if you're able to create that two metres of physical distance, a mask is not required. The second part of the question, Adam, was with respect to the supports. Uh, the supports uh, that we have provided to the small business community uh, with a grant uh, to our small business community, we've provided supports as well to the tourism and economy accommodation uh, community. We have provided supports uh, to a, a buy local initiative here in the province to support our small businesses in community after community. And as we move forward, there are not going to be cuts outside of the cuts to the power rates, outside of the cuts to t uh, people's taxes, and outside of the cuts to uh, what families are spending in the way of now, raising Mr. their Mr. kids. When you were asked the other day at your platform launch whether you would rule out cuts, you were asked five times and five times you refuse to do it. There will your be no finance cuts, minister, Mr. We will your be finance cutting power minister rates. has we will said be that the road ahead is austerity. And why would anyone believe you when we saw what happened in 2017, a government that had promised no cuts, promised not to touch the crowns, instead sold off, got rid of SDC. We're not and selling crowns. Sell off We're SGI, the cuts that we have decuts. will be in the All way right, gentlemen, of you heard the bell. power rates. You heard the bell. We're going to keep talking about the economy. Adam, your second question. You led right into my next question. You both mentioned your plans and your opening statements. You're getting into the economic recovery. What specific steps are you going to take to help the economy recover through the pandemic? Mr. Miley, 45 seconds. Thanks for the question, Adam. We know that even before the pandemic, folks in Saskatchewan were having a hard time making ends meet, living paycheck to paycheck. We were leading the country already in the number of people having to walk away from their mortgages, leading the country in the number of people having to declare bankruptcy. These are our friends and neighbours. These are folks across the province who are struggling. When I asked Mr. Mo about that recession in the legislature, he said that it was news to him. It was sure not news to the struggling families across Saskatchewan who are looking not for cuts. They're looking for a government that will invest now. Invest now in creating jobs right here with Sask First Procurement, in raising wages and doing the work to make life more affordable and showing that they actually understand where people are at right now and how much some folks are struggling today. Thank you, Mr. Miley. Mr. Moe, 45 seconds. Uh, the, the economy in Saskatchewan, we do have a plan for recovery. It's a plan uh, to invest in infrastructure where we have provided a $2 billion booster shot to an already uh, large uh, um, infrastructure plan in the province, a $7.5 billion to build schools, to build hospitals, uh, to build our, our roads across the province. Um, we have a plan for a strong recovery that includes balancing the budget by by 2024. Very important that we get back uh, to a balanced budget here in the province so that we have the ability to for sustainable health funding, for sustainable education funding, so that we can ensure that that funding is sustainable for not just today's generation, but so that we can have schools and health care for generations of the future. Thank you, Mr. Mel. It's time for your uh, open debate on the same topic. How do we help our economy recover? As I had said much. earlier, so we have a things... strong plan for recovery. Uh, the Saskatchewan Party has a strong plan for recovery. And as our economy recovers, so will the province's finances. That's why we have put forward a plan to balance the budget by 2024. Mr. Miley has no plan to balance the budget at all. He has a plan to make a plan to balance the budget. He has put forward a $2.7 billion costed plan. Um, we had to cost our plan. I didn't think that we were going to have to cost the opposition's plan, but we did. And there is an additional $4 billion that Mr. Miley has not come forward with oh, in his plan, $4 billion in unaccounted spending. And the question that I have is, is, is how do you think Mr. Miley is going to pay for it? And the answer I would give is that he isn't. Saskatchewan people are. So this is the message that we hear over and over from Mr. Moe. When we talk about the investments we want to make, he tells us that we can't afford them. What is he really saying? He's telling the people of Saskatchewan that we can't afford childcare, that we can't afford to not have overcrowded classrooms, that we don't deserve high quality health care. Well, I think he's wrong. I think we do deserve it and that we are worth it. What we can't afford is four more years of Scott Moe and the SAS party, four more years of cuts, four more years of privatization, four more years of backroom deals for the old boys club while ordinary families are struggling across Saskatchewan. Mr. Moe may be satisfied, but the people of the province certainly aren't.
$4 billion in deficit spending, above the $2.7 billion uh, that has been costed out by the, by the NDP. It's available on our website, sasparty.com. We've itemized the items that were not included in the, the NDP platform. It's $4 billion that will ensure that the, balance, the, the NDP uh, obviously, uh, certainly has no plan to balance the budget. Their plan to make a plan to balance the budget will be stretched out, and it is going to result in higher taxes for Saskatchewan people. Well, Mr. Mr. Miley, Moe, is there a timeline? Is there a timeline in terms of balancing the budget with the NDP's spending plans? We're going to balance the budget as soon as we're able, but we're not going to do it in a way that's going to hurt families, and that's the biggest difference. I know that the people across the province, they want to see wise fiscal management, but the deficits that the people I'm talking to are most concerned about are the deficits in our schools, the deficits in our hospitals, the deficits in the bank accounts of ordinary families. And Mr. Moe's plan for cuts to health and education that's a bad idea anytime, but right now, it's downright dangerous. It'll choke our economy and it'll hurt people. It's the wrong approach. This Mr. is the Mo NDP record of not balancing the budget in Saskatchewan. This is the NDP Mr. Mo, record. And this, is why it, this is why it matters. This is why uh, this, this record matters. We're going to speak about this record here this evening. When I graduated high school in the early 90s, many of my friends had to leave the province. They weren't able to come back. Um, they're coming back now, many of them. But they, they had to leave the province because of the, the, the NDP had the dead last job well, creation Mr. record Mo, in the nation. Uh, talking um, about and out of we province. deserve better. I deserve better for my children. They need an province. opportunity to work in a community here in Saskatchewan, and so do yours. Every single project Mr. Mo builds is a, is a company from out of country, out of Mr. province. Miley. We're still talking about the economy. Don't worry, I'll have a chance to, to jump in. We'll go next to Murray Mandrick, political columnist for the Leader Post and Star Phoenix. Murray. Thanks, Molly. Both of your parties are promising hundreds of millions of dollars in spending and rebates. We're looking at a situation where there's a $2.1 billion deficit this year and accumulated $24 billion deficit that we're going to have to pay back. Please tell the folks out there, how is this responsible governance? Mr. Mo. Saskatchewan has a plan to balance the budget here in the province. We have a plan to foster the economic recovery uh, that Saskatchewan uh, is already underway in our province. Um, we didn't wait for the post-COVID environment. We were able to reopen our economy with a solid reopen Saskatchewan plan. We were able to reopen our communities. We were able to, yes, reopen our schools, and we were able to do so safely and keep our COVID transmission rates uh, very low. We have a plan to balance the budget in 2024 for all of the reasons that you had mentioned. Uh, Murray, it is important for us to balance the budget so that we can have that sustainable ability to invest in schools, to invest in hospitals, to make all of the investments that we have made over the course of the last 10 years to ensure that is sustainable for generations to come. We have a plan and we're going to stick to it. Thank you, Mr. Moe. Mr. Miley. Thank you very much. We have seen debt climb under the SASC party, making it more difficult for us to make the investments, but now would be the worst possible time for us to cut. And this is the road that Mr. Moe has told us he's going down. Austerity is the word his finance minister used. We saw that in 2017. In 2017, after having promised uh, that there would be no cuts, that the crowns were safe, they killed off STC, they had dozens of meetings to sell SaskTel and SGI, and they cut deeply in healthcare and education, $54 million. Well, he may be saying one thing today, that if re-elected, we will see austerity, we will see cuts, and that will hurt our economy and make it harder for us to reach balance. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's open the debate. We're talking about the rebates. Why are the rebates the best way to move forward for both your parties? You both have rebates. To foster the economic recovery uh, here in the province, that is well underway. You are going to see cuts to your power bill. You are going to see cuts to your taxes. You are not going to see the sale of any crowns uh, here in the province under a Saskatchewan party government. What you are going to see is an investment in, in the affordability for our families, an investment in the recovery of our economy. We're going to get back to the days uh, where we have been for over a decade now of having the second best job creation rate in this nation. This is the opportunity that Saskatchewan has ahead of it uh, on the backside of this COVID-19 virus. What would challenge that opportunity is, is a, is a plan a to make a plan Let's talk about a balancing about the budget jobs, in some, at some point in Mr. the future Mo? with $4 billion in unaccounted spending. That is, that is the challenge that Mr. Miley has. Let's talk for a moment about those jobs. Every single time the SASC party moves forward with a public project, they manage to send it to a company from Alberta, from Texas, from China, from Tokyo, from England, a $2 billion road around this city built by a company from France. That's wrong. We have the people right here in That's Saskatchewan who are case. unemployed. That's not the case. Unemployed and ready to get to work. 
When we're building our roads, our hospitals, our schools, our power plants, we're building them with our dollars. Why, Mr. Mo, can you never manage to make sure that work is done by our companies and our workers? The road, the bypass around the city had over 70% Saskatchewan content on the people that were working on that. There was companies like Broda Construction out of Prince Albert that had a camp outside of the city here uh, building that road. Uh, Graham Construction, a Saskatchewan company, a Saskatchewan-based company um, that built the Saskatchewan Hospital in North Battleford. We had Graham Construction building the, uh, the hospital in Jim Patterson Children's Hospital. hospital. Mr. Mo? Pardon me? It was a company from England that built that hospital. No, it, was, it went it was, bankrupt because of the no, peace. It was, it was, it was, it was ground now, construction. And this is where the question the question the, the remains. The fact of the matter is, is that this is the record of inf investment in infrastructure by this government is solid. We have re re invested billions of dollars in schools and hospitals and roads, unlike the record of the NDP, who closed 176 schools, closed a school a month the entire time they were in government. So the question remains, Mr. Mo, the of province. the major projects there's in no, this country. There's no Saskatchewan province. people working on a project Mr. Mo, let's hear when Mr. you Malley close respond. the hospital or when you close let's the Let's hear Mr. Malley respond. Mr. Mo, the, the question remains, why do you think that Saskatchewan workers wouldn't be able to build a road around Regina? They did. Every single they time did. you managed to send these jobs away, the power plant in Swift Current, less than half of the workers were from Saskatchewan. That's the power not plant correct. in Swift Current, only 20% of the money stayed in, in the province. Why? Do you not think Saskatchewan workers are fit for the job? Why do you insist Gentlemen. on instead of stimulating our economy, stimulating the economies of Gentlemen, France? Gentlemen, we have we have Texas 20 seconds. I want to get Alberta. this in because we're talking about the rebates. Given the enormity of the COVID situation, given the fact that we have no vaccine and we don't know the it's very uncertain the future. Are we, is Saskatchewan voters going to expect rebates for years from both of your parties? This is why it's it was time important. to make sure we support people. This it is really, really is, is not yes. a time to let people go. This is why it was important for us to reopen the economy and reopen safely, is to ensure that we could get Saskatchewan people back to work. Okay, Murray, we are coming back to you for question number two. Our core industries like agriculture, oil, mining are certainly changing, uh, but the question becomes what do we do to help them? in this new environment that we're in? And what do we do to encourage and bring to this province more sustainable industries in the future that maybe are going to be less susceptible to markets? Mr. Miley, 45 seconds. Thank you very much. We know that workers in, in oil and gas, in potash and other key sectors in our province have been hurt, uh, especially with the downturn in prices during COVID-19. Lots of people are struggling. We need to be there to support those essential industries. We also need to not limit our opportunities. We saw under Mr. Moe uh, the killing of the solar industry when they got rid of net metering. We've seen the SAS party kill off film. Uh, right now, we have incredible opportunities. We, sh we have the best opportunity for solar energy, for wind, anywhere in the nation. We should be leading the way with geothermal, with solar, bringing back a film industry, creating all the opportunities for a diversified, more resilient economy, instead of sending those jobs away, as Mr. Moe has done. Mr. Mel. You're exactly right, Murray. Food, fuel, and fertilizer is a way that Saskatchewan has created wealth for generations now. And, and those industries, uh, plus some additional industries as we move forward, will continue to uh, be the very basis of the Saskatchewan economy. That's why we have set targets in our plan for growth, targets of increasing our exports by up to 50%. And this is why this recipe has been working of uh, adding value to these products. Uh, we have the lowest the lowest uh, unemployment rate in Canada uh, today have now for two months. We have had the second highest job creation rate now for 13 years uh, in the nation. This is a record that we are very proud of. It's a record of where we have had private, private industry invest in mining. Uh, the most sustainable mining projects in potash and uranium in the world, most sustainable agricultural investment, as well as the energy investment that is that among is the time. most sustainable in the world. That is your time. Open debate. How do we make Saskatchewan more sustainable? Well, you know, earlier we were talking about some numbers, and, and Mr. Moe was, was making up some new ones. But there's one number that I think we can't well, avoid, and we you can have see it to agree on. It's on and our that, website. That number is 13. 13 cents. That's how much we saw the minimum wage go up just the other day leaving us still with the lowest minimum wage in the entire country. And, you know, these are the folks on the front lines, uh, the folks in our grocery stores, the folks in our pharmacies and our gas station, the people we've all thanked. Thank you so much for stepping up for us. These services are essential. Mr. Moe has thanked them as well. But what kind of thanks is a 13 cent raise? Why does Mr. Moe think the workers in Saskatchewan are worth less for their labor than folks in Alberta, in British Columbia, in New Brunswick. Why do you not think they're worth it, Mr. Moe? 
In Saskatchewan, we have taken 112,000 people off the tax rolls. We have very much focused on the affordability for families in this province. A family of four in Saskatchewan today pays absolutely no income tax on their first $51,675 of earned income. This is one of the highest tax-free th thresholds in the nation. Personal and child uh, spousal exemptions have increased at twice the rate in the last uh, decade. We are very proud of the investments that we have made in the affordability for families, in particular, taking low-income families off the off the tax roll altogether. So um, the question, the, 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 Mo, job, the, I, the jobs that are available in our communities are in agriculture, they're now. in energy, they're export-related jobs. And my question to you is: is the the industries that are either not directly involved in exporting are involved in servicing those export-related jobs? We need to, as leaders, support. Those industries, some of the most well, sustainable Mo, the industries you've been in the most world, successful you yourself Mo. have not Mo. supported yep. those industries. Uh, Mr. And you have a candidate that is Mr. an anti-oil candidate that is not also not supporting those Let's industries. Mr. Mr. Mo, the thing you've been most successful at exporting is Saskatchewan jobs. No, that's and not actually when what it the comes to the minimum say. wage in this province, we have people who are working full time, hardworking folks who've stepped up during the pandemic and shown incredible leadership. And yet, what have they been shown from this government? A 13 cent raise. Still the lowest minimum wage in the entire country. We've got people working full time and having to stop by the food bank on the way home. So the, the question remains, Mr. Mo, why do you think that Saskatchewan workers deserve the lowest minimum wage in the entire country? Do you really, are you proud that that's our record? The record of Saskatchewan, and this is the facts, the record of the Saskatchewan is that we have had the third highest economic growth rate from 2007 to 2019. Our population has increased by 170,000 people in communities right across this province. We've had the second highest job creation record relative to under the NDP. We were dead last cents, in the Mr. nation, Mo. dead last cents. in the nation. Do you and really today, believe just that today, 13 cents? Just today, we have the second, we have the lowest unemployment rate in the nation of Canada. This is due to what you have done as Saskatchewan people. You have stopped the spread. You have slowed the spread of COVID-19 in our communities. Thank you, gentlemen. You've allowed us to open our economy and get back to work. Thank you, gentlemen. That's all the time we have for that segment. Let's turn now to Vanier Scholar, former journalist and First Nations University lecturer, Merelda Fiddler. Merelda. Uh, first of all, thank you, gentlemen. Um, as a Métis woman, though, in this province, I see many missed opportunities to build strong and mutually beneficial relationships with Indigenous people. If you become our next Premier and you really want to put people first and build strong communities, what is one thing that you would do personally to show us you intend to build those stronger relationships with Indigenous people? Mr. Mel. When we talk about a recovery uh, in our communities, whether they be Indigenous communities or, or otherwise, we mean a strong recovery for absolutely everyone. So one thing that I would commit to and have worked on already, but will continue to work on, is the engagement of our Indigenous communities in our forestry industry. I have seen the success of that. I've brought the Premiers out for the first time to meet in an Indigenous community in Big River First Nation, uh, where we met and we heard stories of how um, that community has used an agreement with the provincial government for a forest man management area. They they have used the profits from that agreement. They have invested those profits in the Darby Morin Center of Excellence, the Darby Morin Education Center, to ensure that they are able to offer uh, to offer education to their children, to that next generation, so that they have every opportunity to succeed. Thank a win-win-win win needs to be expanded. That is your time. Mr. Miley. Thank you for that question, Merelda. It's extremely important. For Saskatchewan people, there's a, a core value that everyone should have a chance to succeed here, to have a great life. And yet working with First Nations and Métis communities in the north, in inner city Saskatoon, I've seen the barriers firsthand and how that results in, in worse health outcomes, in tougher time getting work. You know, it holds not just First Nations and Métis people back, but it holds us all back. That costs the entire province. What we need is a government that isn't going to pass the buck and say that that's someone else's problem, but that is actually going to want to do the work. And that's my commitment, is to work with First Nations leaders, federal government to close the gaps in health care, in education, in justice, in employment, so that Saskatchewan value of everyone Miley. having a chance is something we achieve. Thank you, Mr. Miley. I can see uh, my colleague wanting to get in on one more before the open debate. Let's get to that question. Sure. I'm wondering, as you start to build these relationships and create these policies, 
What role do the Indigenous people within your own parties play in helping you design these things? Three minutes. Uh, Thank you for that question. Sorry, sorry. That's, uh, that's really important. And we've been really lucky. Uh, I've got to work uh, with Buckley Belanger, uh, who's our MLA for Athabasca, and, and Doyle Vermette uh, for Cumberland. Uh, we have several candidates, First Nations and Métis candidates, running for us this time. That helps so much to have those folks around the table and in the legislature. And I, I'm recalled to uh, an experience just uh, not that many weeks ago, where Doyle Vermette, uh, MLA for Cumberland, uh, Métis man himself, he, sp he spoke up about what he's seen in his community, about the number of funerals he's had to attend, the number of families he's had to console or, or counsel, folks who are, are talking about taking their lives at a time when we are leading the country in the number of people who are dying by suicide. And he gave an amazing speech an amazing speech in the legislature to support his bill for suicide prevention about those experiences. And I watched the premier watch that speech and his colleagues on the other side as well with their hearts in their eyes. And, and I hoped for a moment that maybe just for once they would actually vote with us for something like that. But instead they voted 44 of them. Every single one had voted against a legislated suicide prevention strategy. And so I have a question for Mr. Moe. Why did you vote against that important bill brought forward by a Métis MLA? Uh, legislation is not required uh, to work on something as important as suicides. So you know we're very well, Mr. Miley, that we have our Pillars for Life strategy in place. That Pillars for Life strategy is working, um, is guiding us through the conversation around how we are engaging, engaging with our partners across the province on a very important conversation, one around uh, suicides, and in particular, uh, yes, northern suicides. We re most recently signed a letter of commitment with the FSIN, with the federal government. Both need to be partners in this conversation conversation to build on that very direction that we had in the in the pillars for life on the question of engagement engagement within our party and engagement with uh, community leaders across uh, the province indigenous community leaders at all levels um, that engagement uh, is an, is not a new piece part uh, is not a new engagement that engagement has been going on and it needs to continue into the future I'd look back I'd like to, to the conversation we had a uh, not only uh, at the at the big river first nation but the conversations that we've had at the tribal council level on our 18 uh, partnerships when it comes let's, to child and family services. Let's talk about that engagement I'm now more, working Mr. on the implementation of Bill C-92 to now, ensure that only, our children are taken care of and taken care Mr. of in Mo, their Can community. I ask about the, the pillars of life? You said that it's working. I mean, I looked at the statistics. There's been a thousand people that have lost their lives over the last five years, many young people, many Indigenous. Right. It's larger than the first half of the decade. So. How do we measure success when we're dealing with people's lives? Well, I'd, I'd quote, and I don't do this often, but I'd quote, uh, you know, John Horgan last night who talked about, um, you know, this is going to take us some time to work our way uh, through this conversation, but we are going to need everyone at the table uh, to find our way through that conversation. The Pillars of Life strategy is an important strategy as it guides that conversation. It's supported by the Canadian Mental Health Association, but it, more work to do from all sides on yeah, this conversation. It's a very sensitive issue. We're going to go back to Meralda. She has another question that maybe touches on that. I do. Both parties have talked about job creation and engaging Indigenous people in all of this job creation. But when we look at statistics like Indigenous women are 12 times more likely to go missing or be murdered, or when we look at incarceration rates in our province of 75% Indigenous people, and we factor in that three times the national average uh, for Indigenous suicides versus non-Indigenous suicide, how do you connect those with your job creation strategy? Where do you start? What's that starting point for you? Mr. Miley, 45 seconds. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think it's exactly there that we need to look. If we're asking the question, are we getting this right? It's the outcomes that will tell us. 60% of kids in, on reserve in Saskatchewan are living in poverty. A quarter of kids in the province as a whole living in poverty, clearly, the approach that Mr. Moe has taken so far, it isn't working. We're not closing that gap. And that's why I would make that commitment, that annually we'll release a closing the gap report that fully outlines the work done and the true statistics on health, on employment, on education, on justice, and we'll use that. And a speech in the legislature uh, where we will highlight this as a top priority and allow this government to work 
as a facilitator instead of a barrier, as we've seen Thank under you, Mr. Mr. Malley. Mo. That is your time, Mr. Mo. Forty-five seconds. The, the, the conversation has to happen at the very local at the very local level, and it is occurring. And yes, the supports need to be there, whether it be uh, conversations around how we support young women in our Indigenous communities and, and in other communities, how we support uh, those that are struggling with mental health challenges, maybe addictions challenges. And so there is a, a holistic uh, and conversation leading to a vi investment that needs to occur, and it needs to occur in conjunction with our, our Indigenous uh, communities. Um, it also is going to require us putting our foot forward and investing alongside, as we did in the forest management agreements that I mentioned earlier. Uh, most recently, we have also put forward an uh, investment in the energy industry with Project Re Reconciliation, an Indigenous-owned energy company looking to purchase some of the TMX pipeline, mm -hmm. as well as a First Peoples pipeline Jamal, on that, that is project your time. to Churchill. Once again, let's debate this question. The clock starts now. I'd like to uh, return to that concept of, of engagement and, and conversations. And, and we hear some good words here, but words will not get us reconciliation. It takes action. And you know, suicide prevention strategy. Not only was Pillars for Life described by experts as, as so vague as to be meaningless, unable to save lives, there's another story that really comes forward here. And that's, uh, that's someone by the name of Tristan DeRocher. Tristan walked all the way from La Ronge to Regina, nearly 700 kilometers. He then fasted just over there, outside the legislature, for 44 days, one day for each of the SAS party MLAs who voted against a suicide prevention strategy. And instead of engaging in conversation, instead of meeting him, Mr. Mo, you sent two of your ministers across the road to basically say, get off my lawn. That, what family who's lost someone to every young person who is struggling right now with whether or not they feel their life is something they can continue? Mr. Yeah, absolutely. There are two ministers uh, in the government of Saskatchewan that did miss, meet with uh, Mr. DeRocher. And, and I think it's important for us all to realize that uh, that everyone agrees with what Mr. DeRocher is advocating for. He's advocating for uh, the the investment and the recognition of something uh, that we all need to do and we all need to work collaboratively on in reducing uh, Indigenous suicides and in reducing suicides uh, in Northern Saskatchewan. The Pillars for Life strategy, you say it is uh, uh, not endorsed by experts, but it's endorsed by the Can Canadian Mental Health Association. Um, it does lay out the the strategy, the efforts, the action that needs to take place in the, in the months and in the years ahead. One of those actions I mentioned already was a letter of commitment with the FSIN and the federal government to work uh, specifically on uh, Indigenous and Northern suicides in this province. Well, this, is a, this is a plan, this is a strategy remains. for the province. It's a strategy that needs to be invested in in the years ahead, and it will be. That okay. question remains then. If this is something you take seriously, if you really want to see action on this, why, instead of sitting down with Mr. DeRocher, with the Walking With Our Angels folks, why did you send the ministers with a very simple message. The message was, pillars of life is good enough, now go away, get off the lawn. Well, and certainly you not. That was that young man. Mr. Mo, let me ask Why did question. you not meet with him? Why not have the conversation? Do you, do you regret, if you look back at... It's going to take some time. Do you think, Mr. Mo, you would have done anything differently with Mr. DeRocher specifically? I think uh, it was a very high-profile story, so I think Saskatchewan people want to know. Bring those actions as I had referenced. Thank you. Uh, I want to get to, last but not least, Alison Bamford from Global News. Thanks, Molly. Uh, I've heard from teachers that over the six-month school break, students slid back several reading levels and are now testing well below grade level. Many teachers don't think they'll be able to get their students to where they need to be for the next grade, given the current classroom conditions. What will you do to ensure teachers can get these students to grade level by the end of the school year? Mr. Mo, 45 seconds. Well, we're, we didn't wait for a pandemic to invest in education in this province. We've built 57 new schools across the province. We had the highest investment in education in this last year's budget, and we're going to continue to invest in education. And yes, we've increased that investment by $155 million uh, as, a pan, as a pandemic response. Use some of the contingency fund uh, that we had in the budget to ensure uh, that we are able to, to provide the resources that have been requested by teachers and by school divisions across this province. Um, we have dispersed of, of $51 million of those dollars. The rest will be dispersed on, on request with those dollars. Now, we've provided for over 440 staff that have come into our schools to ensure that our educators and, and most importantly, our students uh, have the supports that they need to ensure that they Thank have you, every sir. opportunity to uh, succeed in this Thank pandemic you, environment. Mr. Miley. Thanks very much for the question, Allison. It's a very good point. After having those months off, we're having kids trying to catch up in classrooms that were already overcrowded. 
already overstressed. We have more kids in our classes, but not just more kids, more kids with special needs, more kids coming to school with mental health troubles or, or coming to school hungry because a quarter of children in Saskatchewan continue to live in poverty. COVID-19 has simply exposed the problems that already existed in our classrooms that teachers and parents have been speaking up about for years. And that's why we have to change it. And this is our commitment. We will invest and bring in hundreds of new teachers, of new educators, Sure that our return to schools is safe. We talked to teachers, we talked to parents, we talked to the school boards, and we listened. We had a very public conversation on the return to school uh, here in the province of Saskatchewan, and, and that is a good thing. And that allowed us to ensure that we were able to come up with a plan that was adaptable, that was flexible, and I would say that is effective. As our children are returning to school, there's con contingency funds that were made available to ensure that that plan was backed up with the financial resources that it would, that it would need, and there's been now, over 440 staff that have now entered Mr. into Mon our schools to ensure that it remains safe. Not a single dollar more between a, a budget that was introduced prior to the pandemic and a budget that came in after the pandemic. Million. Exactly the same amount until parents, teachers, families, kids spoke up and said, we're not okay with just hope that things are okay and go back to normal. Things were already a problem. Our classrooms were already overcrowded and over complex and COVID-19 has simply exposed that even more. And yet still, we have yet to hear you acknowledge that our classes are overcrowded. Do you accept that there's too many kids in our classes and we have to make the investments now to bring down class sizes, especially in the middle of a pandemic? Mr. Miley, how do you pay for those thousand new teachers? Where does that come from? This is a core investment. To not do this right now would be the worst possible idea. We have Mr. Mo talking about his plan for austerity. It was asked the other day five Mr. times. Mr. where does that money come from? Oh, I mean, from we're dealing with COVID, we're dealing with an oil taxes. slump. Uh, where does that money come from for, for Saskatchewan taxpayers? Well, th this is an investment and it's a key investment. But you know, Mr. Mo just threw out a, a word there. He had a little, uh, little nice word there. He said higher taxes. Well, we've made a commitment. Unlike Mr. Mo, who's refused to rule out higher taxes for ordinary families, unlike Mr. Mo, who raised the PST by $800 per family back in 2017, we will not raise taxes for ordinary families by a single cent. The only increase that we are committed to is asking those very few families, those folks with over $15 million free and clear in assets, to pay a little bit more Right now. $0.7 billion plus the $4 billion that you missed. Uh, you are accounting with your tax increase for 1%. 1% of refused. your deficit spending that you Why have put forward. You Where Miley? is the other 99% going to come from? It's going to come from you. Perfect time, gentlemen. Let's go back to our last question of the night. Alison Bamford standing by. Switching gears from education, in Saskatchewan this year, overdoses are on track to kill more than double the number of people than COVID-19, impaired driving, and car accidents combined. What will you do to immediately address this crisis and save lives? Mr. Miley, the floor is open. Thank you very much, Allison. You know, we hear the stories of, of people who've lost sons and daughters. You know, these are not just numbers, uh, not just statistics. These are people's lives. And... As a dad, I feel that, that same fear, right? You, you try to raise your kids, you try to help them make good choices, but you worry what will happen. Crystal meth has made our streets less safe. Opioids are taking lives. And now we have a government that is talking about cuts. That's a bad idea anytime. But right now, it's a dangerous, dangerous notion. Now is when we need to invest. That's why we're committed to supporting harm reduction, to a crystal meth and opioid strategy, and to bringing in dedicated mental health and addictions emergency rooms so people get the care they need right away. Thank you, away. Mr. Miley. Mr. Mo. I would just say this is a very important uh, question, very important question that cuts occurs. Um, but we need to continue to... Con For opioids, I'm ready to make a change. And we have to tell them, we'd love to help you. But you're going to be waiting three months, six months, a year and a half before you can get any care. And we might as well be telling people, we just don't think you're worth it. Uh, go back and start using again. And this is what frustrates me the most. We've seen wait times grow for mental health and addiction services, for surgeries, for MRIs in our emergency rooms. And I just got to ask, what are we waiting for? When is this government actually going to do something about wait times? Well, new Democrats will. We'll bring in hundreds of new healthcare professionals, nurses, doctors. We'll bring down those wait times so that you can get the care you need when you need it. 
With respect to uh, the investment, in, and I talked about our investment in mental health, going into those very detox beds, going into the staff uh, that would uh, uh, be working uh, with those in individuals, that's where that $30 million this year and last year is going. Um, we are continuing to invest in urgent care centres in Saskatoon and Regina, which will have a mental health and addictions component to those, to ensure that we are increasing uh, that continuum of care. We costed ours out fully at, at $15 million each, and Mr. Miley's a, a little bit lower than that. He'll, that's where uh, one of the inaccuracies of his uh, of his costed platform is. We've also added our core services to our health care uh, with record funding over the course of the last number of years. We've brought 900 physicians into our communities to care for our family members. We've brought 4,000 nurses into our communities and into our facilities, many of them new facilities, uh, to care for our, our family members. The, the doctors and nurses that you have promised in your platform, with all due respect, Mr. Miley, don't even replace the doctors and nurses that left this province the last time the NDP had the opportunity to govern. Gentlemen, we, ha we have well, about Mr. a minute Mark. left in, the, in this part. I want to ask about the safe consumption site, the first of its kind in Saskatchewan. Uh, I learned that citizens raised money to, to make sure that that runs well. Would either of your governments fund that going forward? The other day I stood up with, uh, with Mary Adgeritis, who's a, a mother in, and an advocate in Saskatoon, and she lost her son to opioids. And she said something that really stuck with me. She said, so instead of getting sent away, as we see so often today, people get the help they need and deserve. Mr. Mo, would you fund a safe I would, consumption site? I would, I, would, I would point back. We, we would consider the safe consumption site if we have the honour to, to, uh, to form government uh, on October the 26th. Um, and we would consider it alongside all of the other investments that we have made, that we continue to expand on, to ensure that families and family members that are um, experiencing a drug and, a drug and addictions um, have the supports that they need. This is an investment that's in the works. It's an investment that needs to continue regardless of whose government Thank you, in the gentlemen. future. Well, it is time already to wrap up the debate. Uh, we have two minutes for each of you for your closing statements. And we will start tonight with the Sask Party's Scott Mo. Well, thank you very much, Molly. And uh, tonight you heard some very clear differences between the two major main parties in this election. And a clear answer to the question, who do you trust to lead Saskatchewan's economic recovery? The Saskatchewan party has a record of growth. The NDP do not. The Saskatchewan party has a plan for a strong recovery. The NDP do not. The Saskatchewan party has a plan to balance the budget. The NDP do not. And the Saskatchewan party will make life more affordable. While the NDP's reckless spending will drive up the deficit and it will drive up your taxes. So the choice is clear. The Saskatchewan party has a plan for a strong Sask Saskatchewan is strong. Molly, thanks to our panelists. Thank you, Mr. Moe, for the discussion. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And if you made it all the way through to this point, good for you. Uh, and I'm really glad you did, uh, because this is a crucial moment for our province. The choice before us could not be more clear. Mr. Moe, he's satisfied. He thinks things are just fine. And he doesn't want to see any change. But people across Saskatchewan have been having a much harder time. Mr. Moe refuses to rule out more cuts to health, more cuts to education, cuts that are a bad idea any time and, and right now are downright dangerous. It's just not good enough. It's the wrong approach. The choice before us couldn't be any more clear. A tired, old SAS party offering nothing but more cuts and privatization or a new direction, a new vision that invests in people, gets our economy moving and helps each other out in this difficult time. And that's why we plan. We plan to make sure every patient can get the care they need when and where they need it. That every kid gets the help from the teachers and EAs, the support they need to thrive in school. That every senior can stay home for as long as possible. And that every Saskatchewan worker is back on the job and making a decent wage. So that everyone, every person in Saskatchewan has a chance at a great life right here. Because this is our home. This is our home and this is our chance to make it even better. So tonight, I ask for your support tonight and the weeks ahead and years ahead as we build that better future together. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you, Mr. Miley. Well, that is all the time we have for you tonight at the beautiful Provincial Archives of Saskatchewan. Thank you to both leaders for your passion for our province. Thank you to our panelists for all your amazing questions and to all the people behind the scenes that made this night possible.
Democracy is a beautiful privilege we have in this country. We hope you exercise that freedom by casting a ballot on October 26. And just a reminder, if you want to vote by mail, applications are due by tomorrow. Can you punch them up? Can I see them? Sure. I do. I just see the debate. Can I have the dip, the dip, the right now?